Hello and welcome to Legal Thinking with me, Ed Wooten, and my co-host, although he's not here right this second, Liam Pape. Uh, this week we are revisiting uh, an old podcast from six months ago now uh, about the new Highway Code. Our guests on the episode are Alan Hiscox, Director of Safety at the British Horse Society, Simon McMichael of the cycling publication Road CC, and Mark Hamilton, a partner at RWK Goodman and a specialist in cycling accident claims, as well as a cyclist himself. So uh, without further ado, let's listen again. So to start off, Mark, could you please explain to us in brief what the changes are to the highway cord? Uh, well, the aim of the highway code has been redefined. Um, previously, it said that all road users should be considerate towards each other. Uh, and now the emphasis is very much on promoting safety on the road, whilst also supporting a healthy, sustainable and efficient transport system. The main sort of change into the, the highway code that became effective at the end of January was uh, really to sort of introduce this concept of having a hierarchy of road users, which places those road users most at risk in the event of a collision at the top of the hierarchy, um, sort of emphasising the point that those people in charge of vehicles that can cause the greatest harm in the event of a collision should bear the greatest responsibility to take care and reduce the danger they pose to others. The, the focus at this stage and you know, in this sort of iteration of the code is um, very much on vulnerable groups with uh, specific consideration given to overtaking, passing distances, uh, cycling and pedestrian priority at junctions, opening vehicle doors and the responsibility of various road users. That's sort of the approach that's been taken to this um, this updated or, or sort of new version of the highway code. And within that, a number of the rules have been either clarified or amended, um, just perhaps not not in the way that we've seen reported in some of the um, you know, the tabloid media recently. You've mentioned that um, obviously the, tab- the tabloid media is... Um perhaps misrepresented to uh, put it kind of uh, lightly um, maybe how, how things have changed so does this give you know in, in inverted commas too much power to cyclists and pedestrians as you know some people might suggest not in my view um, a, a lot of the things that we've seen reported as, as changes really aren't changes they're just um, sort of clarification of, of rules that existed uh, a, a good example of that is uh, riding to a breast. Some people sort of considered the previous content to be unclear, and it said that um, you know cyclists, for example, shouldn't shouldn't ride more than two abreast. But obviously, that's not um, not to say they shouldn't ride two abreast. Whereas now, the um, the sort of revision in the code says that cyclists can ride to a breast and it can be safer to do so. Things like that aren't um, aren't changes. I'd say they're just sort of tweaks and clarifications. Where there probably has been a significant change is um, the, the approach to, to sort of the new rules at junctions. Under the, the new rules, um, motorists should give way to more vulnerable road users who are using that junction uh, and should give way to those vulnerable road users such as pedestrians, cyclists or horse riders in a way. So it doesn't, so it doesn't necessarily give them more power, it kind of just recognises the, the hierarchy that perhaps was already there. Yeah, it's just placing the, the greater burden of responsibility for, for safety on our roads, on, on those people that can cause the most damage. For example, at a like I say, at a junction now, um, the, the sort of rules specifically say that motorists should give way to pedestrians crossing or waiting to cross a road into which or from which they are turning. That sort of is, is applied more broadly to horse riders and cyclists as well. Um, so I've seen it suggested that you know that change, for example, will lead to more collisions and more uh, crashes. But I think that um, certainly remains to be seen. I think it is clear that you know a lot of people have never really understood the rules of the highway code and will now have a, a responsibility to learn what these changes are. But as to whether pedestrians are suddenly going to assume that the, the motorist heading towards the junction they wish to cross is fully au fait with the rules and will just step out and sort of assert their um, priority at that junction, I think is probably a stretch. 
just from your perspective, Alan, I wondered um, whether uh, you could give us perspective on how this is, has affected or will affect horse riders. Well, it, it certainly has affected them already and in a good way. We've had lots of um, messages from horse riders saying that uh, drivers have been much more considerate to them, you know, giving them uh, more space and passing a lot slower. So it, it has had an impact. Um, but uh, you know, I was I was pushing for much more clarity and detail in the highway code when I knew that uh, a review was taking place because before it just said pass horses wide and slow. Well, wide and slow could mean anything to anybody. So now actually getting that advisory speed of ten miles an hour and that two meters distance is is, is very important. It's, it's actually almost involving drivers now rather than having sort of a nebulous pass wide and slow now we've got some detail so as regards um, the British Horse Society and equestrians it's it really is um, adding that clarity but also you know it, it, it's all it says that everybody needs to behave responsibly so although the hierarchy and we're very happy to be alongside cyclists with um, carriage drivers as well you know it doesn't remove the need for for everyone to behave responsibly so as mark has said you know it, it's it's something that was already there but that respect and consideration for other road users i'm hoping will uh, magnify as the details uh, of the department of transport's um you know publicity campaign for this uh, extends Simon, would you like to add something? Uh, yes, and um, you know, as Alan said, um, yes, we, we'd like to see greater respect between road users. You know, whichever means of transport they use to, to get around. But what I think's been very, very unhelpful in some of the media coverage in the run up to the the highway code changes is the reporting of. You know, motorists versus cyclists, as though they are totally distinct tribes. And let's not forget that, you know, most adult cyclists have a driving license. Yeah. Um, also, everyone is a pedestrian at some point. As soon as a driver gets out of his car and walks to the shop or whatever, they are a pedestrian. So I think, you know, just, just, the press frame these things as different groups of road users. Um, it, it just doesn't help us at all. Just to jump back over to Alan, um, do you feel that the Department for Transport were open to these changes? Uh, as regards horse riders, very much so. You know, I was um, I, I was invited onto the uh, the stakeholders group, and I've got to say, Cycling UK were uh, instrumental in getting the British Horse Society to to that group. So, you know, th this whole um, vulnerable road users joining together, you know, Cycling UK and uh, the British Horse Society, you know, support each other. So, um, yeah, yeah, they they were very receptive, and uh, I, I I found that we we've almost. Um, got everything that we were we were asking for. It's disappointing in a way that the highway code has required that um, updating and revision to to be so specific about you know precisely what is required because you would hope that everyone would be you know respectful and patient and generous in the amount of space that they afford a cyclist or a, or a horse rider every time they overtake them. But I think probably all of our experiences, that's just unfortunately not the case. So it has been necessary now to go sort of almost a step further and to make it you know, expressly clear to motorists what, what is expected of them when they're overtaking these, um, these vulnerable road users. So happy to see the clarity, but I feel... So just broadly from a social perspective, it's almost disappointing that it was it's come to this and, and that's been required. Clarification is very important because what we found is that um, drivers just were unsure how to pass horses. I was saying that nebulous term, pass wide and slow, and now that clarity is there, uh, I, I think is a, is, is, is a real major step forward. So clarity has been added, but has anything been said about how this is going to be communicated to people who use the road? Um, and to stick with you for a second, Mark, will there be any defence for not knowing the new highway code? If you find yourself in the position of being involved in a collision on the road, then the rules in the highway code and both the civil and sort of criminal liability that attaches to you know some of the 
uh, the other acts like the Road Traffic Act, for example, those rules will be applied in your case and it won't be a defence to say that you weren't aware of the changes or you didn't know what the Highway Code said. In, in terms of the communication, they sort of helpfully created a PDF document which shows the, the deletions and to the old code as well as the additions to the new code. But I, I'm interested to hear from the other chaps about what else they're aware of at the moment, which is going to sort of be you know, bringing this to the forefront of the public attention. Yeah, I think Simon would be a good person to go on that because I think you've been following how uh, the Department for Transport has got plans to um, update their awareness campaign and all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. I mean, one of the disappointing things is that DFT, they put out a press release saying, here's the changes that are coming in, but they didn't follow that up with their own kind of proactive campaign. So it was left to the press to interpret those changes. And we've seen certain elements for the press uh, put their own spin in it and with some, frankly, absolutely misleading headlines. Um, One, for example is the the recommendation that drivers use a technique called the Dutch reach when they open the door, which is effectively using your arm furthest away from the the car door to open it, which naturally turns your body around and makes you look behind so you can see if there's a cyclist or another vehicle approaching. Um, Now, it's an offence at the moment to cause bodily injury by opening the car door into the path of another road user. Maximum fine, £1,000. And there was some, I think the Times reported that as drivers face £1,000 fine if they do not use this technique, which is not what the Highway Code is saying at all. It's an existing law. It's not a new law being brought in. It's one that Cycling UK has been campaigning for years uh, to actually increase the penalty for if it results in cyclists being killed. And and so, you know, that misleading reporting um, is doing more damage, you know, than, than good, I think. And going back to the point Mark made about the, the 1.5 metre uh, close pass rule, the best explanation I saw is this, because, you know, we've had people commenting on social media and on newspaper articles saying, well, why do I, as a driver, have to leave a cyclist 1.5 metres when a cyclist, if I'm at traffic lights, cyclist like, rides past me with 10 centimetres space, uh, which is actually permitted. For, it's called filtering. It's permitted under the highway code, the, the new version. And the best explanation I saw of this was someone said, well... Go and stand on a, on a train station platform within 1.5 metres of the edge of the platform when the train's going past at 30 miles an hour, yeah? And then go on the same platform when there's a train actually stopped there and you walk up and get in the door of the train. It's two totally different things. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a there's a whole round of... Um, I, I read an interesting article from, I think it was Peter Walker on The Guardian who just rounded up all the, all the different kind of bits of uh, misleading reporting from some, from some of the papers such so as like you know cyclists are going to be in the middle of the road and all this kind of stuff yeah i think it's just a shame to sort of use the changes in the highway code as a, an opportunity for sort of clickbait headlines and you know selling newspapers when actually i think we should all be a bit more responsible and see it as a sort of um you know like a almost like a public health issue it's sort of these things i think should be dealt with when people are doing their you know driving tests and it should be an opportunity to educate ourselves because we've all had an interest in these changes and have naturally followed and understand what the what the changes are and how things have been clarified. But if you were to stop people in the street and to take you know a straw poll of who understood what the changes were and what the existing rules said, I think you'd be sort of quite disappointed with what the the level of knowledge was that was out there and it feels like a bit of a missed opportunity not only to to sort of evolve the highway code in this way but also to really um publicize what the changes are and to help people to understand what the rules are what they mean and how we should be applying them on the road because that's what's going to help to sort of remove this sort of tribal attitude and also hopefully to reduce the number of collisions or incidents 
because everyone has a better understanding and appreciation of what's expected of them. This is an opportunity for the DFT to really make the Highway Code a robust document. Um, and I'm hoping that they will they will take this opportunity. And I think that more needs to be made. Um, and I'm sure Mark will have, have views on this, that you know, the Highway Code is used in um, court proceedings and the Road Traffic Act to establish liability. And I've, I've been in court where there's been an incident with a horse and both the prosecution and the defence have poured over the highway code to um, get that, that liability there. And I'm, I'm sure that the, uh, the must and must not and the should and should not is, is unclear for the vast majority of, of drivers. Obviously, new drivers and learner drivers uh, will, will get that instruction. But to make the highway code a robust document and get also the police to use enforcement um, is, is is a real, I think, a, a big issue. And I'm hoping the Department of Transport use this as an opportunity for that. Alan's absolutely right. If, you know, if, if on our you know, way homes from work this evening or, you know, going on a journey at the weekend, if, if we're on cycling or we're riding and we're involved in a collision um, whereby, you know, we happen to be injured and it's we say it's been caused by uh, a motorist who has either sort of driven or behaved negligently or um, we can sort of cite specific rules in the highway code that they failed to have followed, then judges will pour over the highway code. As I said before, they will expect every road user to understand what it means. We've certainly had you know, a, a strong nod in the updated highway code to the importance of a healthy, sustainable, efficient transport system. So what that sort of says to me is we need people to move away from cars and motor vehicles and we need more people, um, sort of especially using active travel. Um, we need to protect those people by introducing this hierarchy of road users so that the clear message is that people should be encouraged to, to make more sustainable travel choices and they will be treated with patience and um, with respect by other road users who now have a, a sort of greater onus than they did before perhaps to be aware of the damage they can potentially cause when they're in their, their vehicle. Some of this stuff is not new to um, sort of court cases and to judges because for a long time um, the courts have been applying the sort of principle of causative potency which is you know, very similar to this new hierarchy of road users that we can see in the code, because what that says is, you know, in a collision between a pedestrian or a cyclist or a horse rider, for an example, and an HGV or a car or a van, you know, that sort of motorised vehicle has the potential to be a, a lethal weapon and to do far more damage to that vulnerable road user than the vulnerable road user has, you know, the potential to do to that to that motorist. And therefore, uh, that motorist should bear a greater responsibility towards the, the more vulnerable person to keep them safe. When it comes to the, you know, the particular circumstances of a, a collision, often what we'll see is, um, I don't know, there might be a dispute between the parties when there's a collision involving a filtering cyclist, for example. But I think that the new code sort of goes further in legitimising filtering than perhaps it did before. When we talked about somebody being knocked off their, their bike um, by somebody opening a car door, that was you know not normally a contentious thing, but now with the recommendation and requirement to use the, the Dutch reach technique, you'd think there's a lot less room for misunderstanding there. I suppose the, the judges have been, you know, for a long time thinking about in, in civil claims. Um, how to apply some of the more subjective rules under the highway code. Whereas now it's going to be much easier to see if somebody has overtaken a vulnerable road user properly and safely. And a lot of these things are, you know, basic courtesies that we can give to one another on the roads. And I think a lot of good drivers will have been doing all of the things that we can see in the highway code for a long time. But clearly a number of motorists don't. And, and that's why these these rules and the code itself needs needs updating and, and needs more sort of precision in certain places. I sort of get the impression that this is the first of perhaps a number of revisions and the DFT wanted to start with, you know, vulnerable groups and looking 
really at um, you know, the, the main sort of changes, which are more to do about um, overtaking, passing distances, priority at junctions, opening vehicle doors, and, and the responsibility of road users generally to, to more vulnerable road users and under this new hierarchy. Yeah. And Simon, I think you wanted to add something to that. You know, as, as, as Mark said, um, you know, a lot of drivers out there are responsible and, you know, they, they are familiar with the highway code. You know, every person who has a driving license will have had to have read and understood the highway code. And if they got the driving license after the theory test was introduced, they will have had to demonstrate their knowledge of that. But there are an awful lot of motorists out there and you can see this in the comments on social media. You can see it in the comments of newspaper articles. You can even see it in the way that some newspaper articles have been framed, that there's a lot of ignorance about what the rules were already. And, and as we said earlier, you know, some of these rules, they're not new rules. They are just existing rules that have been clarified. For instance, you know, cyclists can actually ride to a breast. Uh, cyclists can ride in the middle of the lane, not the middle of the road, as some places have actually reported. But, you know, cyclists are advised under the new code in certain circumstances to ride in the middle of the lane because it's safer. And it's this one thing that is disappointing. You know, the, the new highway code didn't become law until 29th of, of January because it had to sit in front of, you know, the changes had to sit in front of Parliament for a certain amount of time before they were actually passed into law. It's now going to take a couple of months for the new print version of the highway code to hit the shops. You can still walk into your local bookshop now as a learner driver, let's say, and the copy of the highway code you will be buying is still the old one. Hmm. Yeah, so there's 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 more needs to be done to, as we said, raise awareness that there is a change incoming. I, I suppose and ed- educate people. Um, so the other thing it shows to me as well, you know, some of these comments are that there are a lot of people on our roads who didn't actually understand what the highway code already said. Yeah. Yeah, um, there's an interesting point. I I, I just um, wanted to to query uh, basically of, of of everyone, I suppose, um, whoever wants to to respond. But uh, I noticed in the in the in the changes in the, in the PDF that one of the things that they clarified was that only pedestrians may use the pa- pavement. And I just wondered if there's maybe a something more that needs to be done to give. Because cyclists sometimes feel they have to use the pavement in order to stay safe. And I wonder if there's something more that uh, this is the Department for Transport needs to do more to improve infrastructure to ensure that cyclists don't have to use the pavement in, in, in some cases. And I just wondered what um, people's thoughts were on that. Um, there's actually a very interesting point, though, which is that um, back in the late 90s, when fixed penalty notices for cycling on the pavement first first came into force. You know, cycling on the pavement, unless it's a shared use path or a shared area, is against the law. But back in the, the 90s, late 90s, Paul Boateng, who at the time was Home Office Minister, said that that should not be applied to cyclists who are riding on the pavement because they're afraid of riding on the road and who are doing so responsibly and not, not causing the danger to, to pedestrians. And that was reinforced a few years ago um, by the present government, uh, by Robert Goodwill, who was the DFT minister at the time. Um, it's a very grey area. I know it upsets a lot of pedestrians when there are cyclists on the road, uh, sorry, on the, on, the, on the footway. And it's maybe something we've seen become more prevalent in recent years as well with a lot of food delivery cyclists, etc. But um, it's, it's a grey area. And yeah, I agree. It's something that should be tightened up on or clarified at least. Yeah, and Alan, I think you were you were starting to add something. Yeah, the um, the whole issue of safe off road riding for, for for horses and carriage drivers is is, is a big issue. There were sixty six horses killed on the roads last year. What we are trying to do is engage local authorities, um, and when they design um, routes, make them multi user routes. Why? And it's still happening. Are they putting it in um, cycle paths or cycle lanes um, and having the horses in the roads? You'll have cyclists coming up on the inside, traffic on the outside. And this is a real big issue with some councils. Make 
these off-road use multi-user. And again, with the high rate, highway code, you've got pedestrians, horse riders, cyclists there. If we all use those responsibly um, and uh, you know, with, with, with care and attention for each other, it will take horse riders, horses, cyclists and pedestrians off the roads and we will see a significant reduction in injuries on, on, on the road. And it is a, it's, it's a big issue. Multi-user routes are the way forward, but I'm not quite sure where uh, some local authorities are going with this. In this country, I think it sounds as though everyone's sort of fairly unimpressed with a lot of our infrastructure uh, at the moment, especially outside London. And I was just interested in the fact that we have a highway code which you know, makes it clear that it, cyclists are not obliged to use cycle lanes. And I think that has to be the right thing. Um, we shouldn't, you know, shouldn't be obliged. But it also struck me that perhaps it was a recognition that some of our infrastructure and cycle lanes are so poorly designed and so sort of inefficient that we almost needed that rule in the first place. So final question, um, and we'll go to all three of you. We've touched on this a little bit already, but where do you think that the new highway code hasn't gone far enough or areas where further clarification is still needed? Um, Simon, can we come to you first? Um, oh, that's a good question. Um, well, I think that point just now about um, you know using cycling infrastructure, um, mm-hmm. you know, yes, the, the highway code says that Cyclists aren't obliged to use cycle lanes even where, when they're available. But, you know, it it could maybe have explained better about, you know, how that can happen. So, for instance, in the Netherlands, there's actually two separate words to describe someone on the bicycle. Um, you know, there's Fietser, which is someone who just gets on what we would think of as a Dutch bike and is using it to get get around town, to go to school, to go to the shops or whatever. And then there's Vila, which is your actual sporty cyclist. Now, if you are someone who's riding a road bike going 15, 20 miles an hour plus, um, certainly you should not be on a shared use path yeah, with pedestrians. You should be on the, the main carriageway because it's too dangerous. You know, you riding at that speed on, on even if it's a shared use path, a designated cycle path, it's too dangerous for you to be there with the pedestrians. Also, I mean, I remember myself last summer, I was, you know, riding back from Reading along the, the A4. And yeah, there's a kind of cycle path alongside it um, for much of the way. But, you know, it's like half a metre wide and you have brambles overgrowing on, on your left-hand side and it, it's just not fit for purpose. Yeah, let's, let's take it to Alan next, I think. Um, well, as I, as I said right at the start, we, we got pretty much everything we asked for with the highway codes. But what um, I would like to see is, um, is, is enforcement or education. Uh, all right, we, 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 people have said, oh, we need legislation about how to pass horses. Well, the legislation is there with the, the Section 3 of the Road Traffic Act, you know, without reasonable consideration for other road users. Um, so I want to see much more um, publicity, make it a real robust document um, and get some enforcement out there because it's mentioned again in the the changes. It is intimidating to be on a horse when a car or vehicle or even a, a, a bicycle goes past too fast and too close. So it's all about um, getting those messages out there um, about the, the, the safe passing distance, the maximum speed and, and uh, that, that two metres distance, but also not just when you are passing, overtaking a horse, but when you're approaching a horse as well. So it's not just on the overtaking, it's approaching. And that can be just as intimidating and just as frightening for a horse and rider when you get a car coming towards you. All right, there's the, there's the gap from the other carriageway. But as, the, as, as Simon mentions, you know, getting a train passing you at that sort of distance and you're right there, it is intimidating for both the horse and the rider. So that's what I'll be looking for. Um, more, more, more enforcement, more more education and um, you know a greater push by the DFT and the Think campaigns to get these changes noticed. Great, and then Mark, I think from the perspective of people who you know you you've represented, what what do you think in terms of how you know cases are decided? I think a lot of the things contained within the code are um, you know principles that have been applied by judges and insurance companies and 
solicitors for quite a long time. Um, it's nice to see them sort of explained and recognised and, and formalised in the code, but I don't see it anticipate. Uh, I don't anticipate it sort of changing the outcomes of, of you know many of the cases I'm involved in um, for pedestrians, for cyclists, or for for horse riders. Um, it might just give us a bit more. I suppose a bit more data to work with. So I'm not sure if horse riders do the same, but many cyclists, for example, now sort of film their rides. And so you c- can very quickly see if, if an overtaking manoeuvre was dangerous or whether it was sort of failing to give um, necessary room. It might just sort of beef up a few cases in, in that respect. But you know, fundamentally, I don't see it making huge changes to, to what I do day in, day out. Yeah, uh, Jeremy Vine is uh, notorious for cycling around London and filming his rides, and he seems to be constantly running into kind of aggressive uh, drivers and people doing things that they shouldn't be on the road. But um, I don't know if that's just because it's Jeremy Vine and people see him. And uh, and uh, anyway, uh, Simon, over to you. I live very close to Jeremy, and no, it's not just him. <laughs> okay. I don't want a camera, but believe me, that is West London drivers. Um, no, as Mark was saying, um, I think education is key and that's why i think it's disappointing that um the dft i think it's only launching this awareness campaign which starts running on valentine's day i I believe um i think they're only doing that in response to people like cycling uk saying hey guys look at this press coverage that we're getting for your highway code changes can you actually put an awareness campaign out there to to tell people what the actual situation is rather than them relying on the spin that certain parts of the media are putting on it? Alan, something I was interested in when I was looking through the code is um, the BHS Ride Safe Award. And there's a sort of recommendation that inexperienced riders are sort of, well, an encouragement that they should consider that that award or that sort of qualification I, it's often the, the, you know the most vulnerable road users ho- who are more aware of these rules because they're you know keen to absolutely sort of optimize their safety on the roads and i just wondered had, had, has the bhs seen a, an uptake in people inquiring about the ride safe award um, when there, there are more and more people uh, wanting to take it because it is an aware an awareness award, um, not just for for young riders, but for anyone who's experienced or wants to, to gain more information. And um, we've actually had the Greater Manchester Mounted Police and the Lancashire Mounted Police take the award. So it is not just for you know, new riders. And there, there is a huge raft of uh, advice in the Ride Safe Award that gets riders to be aware of what they are um, seeing around them so they can uh, anticipate and you know ensure that their horse is positioned correctly on the roads and, and signaling correctly. There's, there's so many things not just on the roads but riding on the beaches um, riding uh, off road so yeah the ride safe award is is definitely something there and we again very pleased that the um, department of transport put it in there so i'm posting riders to it you know i, I suppose i could equate it to to bikeability in that respect but yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly something that uh, we would like riders to, to take more of. And um, yeah, there is an uptake in it. You're right. Thanks once again to our guests there. If you'd like to find out more about our cycling accident expertise, make sure to visit our injury division at rwkgoodman.com forward slash injury. And as ever, please make sure to subscribe, give us a rating or a like or whatever you like on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And thanks for listening.